This is a podcast from Partnerships for Wellbeing. Hello, I'm Jeff Szynski and welcome to this edition of Ways to Wellbeing, coming to you from Partnerships for Wellbeing in Inverness. I'm about to introduce you to a man whose story is bound to shock you and I'm sure it will sadden those friends and colleagues who knew him either as a radio host with MFR here in Inverness or as We Fat Bob in the Central Belt. Bob McLennan left Scotland 20 years ago and headed for the Far East where he built a successful property business and by all accounts was living the high life far from the Highlands or so we thought. But a few days ago, he walked into my office here at Partnerships for Wellbeing. He sat down and he told me a tale that simply took my breath away. It's a story about being scammed by a woman he loved and trusted. A story about losing almost half a million pounds and then having to sleep rough and beg for food on the streets of a foreign city. And it's about a man who thought he had reached rock bottom and then discovered there was more bad news to come, a diagnosis of cancer. But it's also a story about renewed hope, and one that he's about to share with us now. Bob McLennan, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much, Jeff. Thank you. So let's go back to the beginning, shall we? Um, People know you in Inverness Mm. as uh, a radio host, MFR. Um, Good times. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it was it's hard to believe it was like 40 years ago. Maybe this year it was 40 years mm-hmm. ago. It was 1982 when we when we first started. We were young. Yeah. Had all the hair. Yes. <laughs> so I wanted to believe that you had hair. Yeah, I used yeah. to have this kind of mad curly red hair. You only for about six weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I was one of the earliest bald people. Uh, only six weeks of the year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's where, where people got to know you here in, in the Highlands. Yes. Yeah. Um, and racing through your career... You then went to the Central Belt yep. and a lot of fame there as yeah. We Fat Bob. You didn't mind the name. No, it was um, Robin Galloway, who, who of course is also from the north, uh, from I think originally from North Sand and then on, on the TV as well, Grampian. And he was the one that gave me that name and I heard him singing it one morning when I was coming into work and it just stayed. Everybody called me it from then on. Very good. Then you decided to turn your back on a radio career yeah. or or perhaps the station you worked with no longer existed, that kind of thing. Yeah, it was a kind of coming of two because I'd, I'd been there for about eight years. So I had done the overnight show and then the, the afternoon show and then I moved on to the talk show at night. So I'd done all the kind of the career moves I wanted to do because I always wanted to see if I could, could handle a talk show because, of course, the, the music you get is limited. You only get maybe two songs an hour. And then the rest is all talking with the whole country. And at that time in the UK, especially in Scotland, it was really changing. A bit like now, the whole country. And people needed somewhere just to phone up and, and have their feelings heard. So it was a very successful time for that. Um, and after eight years, it kind of done its course, you know. And I'd done, I think, six years on the, on the nighttime show, on the talk show. So it was time to kind of do something else, you know. And by that time, you'd already started to build up a, a kind of property business. I did. I set up a company called Humble Abode. And so we, we bought properties in the Central Belt. And the idea was to have a property that's really good quality, but don't charge the, the full rent. Because there's still a lot of people just getting on their feet. So it did very well. And the people that stayed there uh, got maybe uh, free rent at Christmas. If they were pregnant, they, they would have to pay just 50% of the rent. So they stayed for longer. And because of that, I could buy more. So by the time I left, Jeff, uh, I think I had maybe 35, 36 properties around. So what prompted the move to the Far East? And what, what, was it the Philippines, first of all? Or? Yeah, it, it was actually Brian Burnett. Um, that prompted it, strangely enough, uh, from Ra- from Radio Scotland. Well, formerly, I don't know if he's still there. It's been a long time. He is. Is he still yeah. there? Yeah. Um, because I was watching a TV show about Brian went to Vietnam. And I had never been to Vietnam. So the timing was trying to find a country that I'd never been to. And also trying to move on from a career which uh, it was the only career I'd ever known. So I wanted to make that transition. So the, the radio and then the property were doing quite well. But I thought it's maybe time now to kind of see the, the rest of the world. So I decided to go to Vietnam on Brian's 
on Brian's show because he used to do a show called I think Scottish Passport, uh-huh. and he was in Vietnam. So I thought well, it looks really good. So that's why I went. So and you took your business with you? I did. Well, I sold it. Um, and then I had to stay away for five years, first of all. So I sold the business, and at that time, as you might remember, properties were doing very well. Um, and I think they were at their peak right about 1999, 2000. So I had done very well from that. So I thought, well, the best thing to do is to, to sell it now, and then maybe return later. But I, I figured that the property market in the Far East had, all, uh, had, had always been strong, but certainly was building in places like Bali, Vietnam, Cambodia, where before you not really good, the law had changed so that a, a UK person, a foreigner, could buy property there, but in partnership with a with a, with a national. But you could still have like forty nine percent shares. So the law had changed a bit. So it seemed to be the right kind of meeting of leaving one place and, and moving to another. But you did well. I did. I did. I, I decided that I was going to do the same kind of idea. So I, I first of all, uh, had a hotel in Vietnam with the same idea as I did in the UK because I, I wanted, travellers don't always have lots of money in that, and so I, I wanted to have a hotel with really nice rooms that had double beds, hot and cold water, uh, Wi-Fi, which was just coming in, plus satellite TV, but not charge a lot of money so that they had extra money to buy gifts to take home to the family and to do these things. So the idea was that if I can get a full hotel and the people are really happy to stay there and it's not you know uh, in bad condition for them then they would stay longer and also they had extra money to go enjoy the, the country and it, and it worked really well like that so it was the same idea from from the central belt but just in the far east but what prompts this kind of altruism i mean this is not a cutthroat kind of business entrepreneur <laughs> we're talking about here. You're yeah, about doing a wee bit of good at the same time. Yeah, because I, I, th- I think that really is the business. It's the, it's the business of the heart. And it was making, it gave me a purpose to get up. I mean, the fact that, that somebody was surprised that maybe they'd stay for five nights and I was only going to charge them for three or, or for four. And mm-hmm. that kind of like, oh, really? And then they, have, they think, well, I can go and I can buy this gift and take it home to my mum or I can spend extra time phoning. At that time, it was expensive to phone home. So it balanced out quite well. As long as I wasn't losing uh, money, uh, then I was really happy not to make a lot of profit but just to do something unusual and, and you know help everybody else so you're not a saint you just find that kind of niche in the market as well yeah well I really enjoyed what I enjoyed most was seeing people really be surprised that I was giving them a good deal and you know that sometimes uh, some people they get they get uh, they lose they lose a little bit of money they lose their wallet they they hire a jet ski their wallet they, they never take their wallet away their wallet bounces out in the ocean mm-hmm. so sometimes they get in these situations so I was really glad that that we were so flexible people knew that we'd be able to help so that's what we did uh, and it worked really well for me because that the feeling of having that kind of wealth was much much better than than having the the cash wealth okay and you found love. Yeah, I, I met a really nice girl there who was really smart, uh, an accountant, and, and we had a great relationship for many years. And then her, her family in Vietnam decided that they wanted to go and live in San Diego because their daughter had gone there, she married an American. So they bought a bus firm, of all things, in San Diego, and they, they then moved over and then she then went with them. So we parted in good terms, but we just you know went our own way. I, I sold the hotel with her, and then she went off to stay in San Diego. So I was kind of uh, ready to experience something else, you know. Okay. So where did it all begin to go wrong? Um, well, I'd been in Asia for probably 17 years, I think. And it had been just great. And at that time, it was going very well. The, the ideas that I had were working. People were enjoying staying there, good reports. And then Airbnb came along, as you, as you remember. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was doing good. So... I moved over to Bali and um, I built a house in Bali and then that was doing great and I got to like 55 I think and I, and I thought I really want to do what I want to do because some people go and they live places just because they think it's time you know you get on a little bit in years and I'd always wanted to be a good pool player so I thought okay where's the best place so I went to Thailand and I watched the tournament and they said the best place to go if you really want to study is to go to the Philippines. So on the 6th of January, 2016, 
2017. I went over to the Philippines for the first time and it, and it was incredible. It's a great place, nice people, they all speak English, uh, they all seem very friendly. And so I thought, okay, this is the place. So I contacted the right people and said, I want to learn. Basically like, you know, getting Ronnie O'Sullivan to teach you at snooker mm -hmm. because they've got some of the world's best pool players are from the Philippines. So they said, sure, okay. So I, then I decided to go there and that's when it kind of turned around. Um, I was five years with the same girl. This is a new girl. And a different girl, yeah, a, a nice a nice girl, but all the while her family were, their eyes lit up when they saw money. They were always kind of asking me to buy them little things, which I did, like, you know, little gifts and stuff like that, um, and to help them. And it kind of took a bad turn. The, the sister had asked me, sister-in-law had asked me if I would help lend money to some of these kids because in hospitals there you have to pay so basically you have a security guard with a shotgun at the hospital door and unless you pay the bill you don't leave the hospital and the, the hospitals in, in the Philippines are very expensive there so I said I would help so I started to help uh, dying kids and, and people with you know illnesses and people who needed any you know help because it was hard to get money from the banks in the Philippines it's very hard so I thought I have this money I'd like to be able to do what I could, you know, uh, to help them. So that's that's how it all began. I kind of opened my heart and opened my wallet at the same time, really. And that went on for three years. And your money gradually draining away. Yeah. First of all, they asked me to help this this woman who was struggling. She had a headache, and it turned out to be a brain tumor. And then they asked me to help these different people. And, and over the period of those years, I'd helped maybe 600, 500, 600 people. And they, they were giving me a, a contract with a photocopy of the guarantee card. And I thought nothing of it because it was my girlfriend's family who are very religious, you know, uh, and do a praying three times a day, every day, every meal. I had no idea that I was kind of heading into a, a trap yeah which which I was I mean people will be surprised that this happened over such a length of time yeah and there will be I suppose a bit suspicious of your generosity yeah but I do know that long ago you yourself had suffered hard times and yeah. you were sleeping rough in the streets of London and things like that yeah is that what prompted your later generosity with people yeah um because the kindness comes from everywhere. It's just astonishing how the people you don't think are going to help you come from nowhere and, and, and help. And so, and also I have a very good mum, which she passed away in November uh, last year. But she was always helping people. So when I was growing up, like the Hells Angels would come and all sleep in my sitting room. And she would help anybody who needed something or, or anybody who needed any help. So I, I got that into my, into my DNA, as it were. I saw my mum doing it. And I thought it's better to, to help somebody than have the money in the bank and hold it there. That does you no good. So it was silly. I, I never suspected a thing. I didn't expect anything because it was. I saw them every day. It was my girlfriend's family. Like you see your best friend every day or your wife. Mm -hmm. And the last thing you do is suspect. And, the, and I know it sounds stupid, but I never suspected a thing. Nothing, nothing at all. I never, for one second, Jeff, I, I never thought... Oh my God, this is a scam. I never... And people always say, how could you be so stupid? I don't have an answer. I wasn't thinking on the stupid side of my brain. I was thinking on the, the kindness side of my brain. And, and, and I have this belief that you only get what you want in your life if you help other people get what they want. Mm -hmm. So if you can put somebody's life a little bit better, then really that's, that's what it's about. If you can just help somebody just a little bit... And so I guess they played me at that. So they played you, and at what point, how did it all end? Well, I'd lent, I'd given, as I say, about 600 people, uh, totally about just under $500,000. And... What, how does that translate in terms of... Well, it was it, uh, it's about 400 and probably £435,000, round about that. Almost half a million. About half a million, yeah. And... At the same time, the place I had in Bali, uh, it suffers, Bali suffers really bad rain. Anybody who's been to Bali knows it's like six months of heavy rain. 
And so I needed to keep the staff and to pay the repairs. So I needed to get the money that I'd lent in the Philippines, which had been promised to be returned, I needed to get that back. Mm -hmm. um, but it wasn't to be. So these were loans that you'd given out, yeah. you expecting the money back. You yeah. now needed the money yeah. to keep your properties secure and safe and, yeah. and windproof and weathertight. And indeed, just to keep your whole business afloat. Yeah. And then you discovered what? Um, I'd asked them if they could return the money. And they always said, yes, but it'll have to be next week because the way that the Philippine Christmas season works or the way that their salary works or the way that uh, the people can pay back. or uh, There was always a reason. So then I said, you really have to pay it back. And this was on the, I think, the 16th or 15th of December. It was, it was going up towards Christmas. So I said, you have to pay everything back by the 10th of January. No problem, because these are all our friends and, mm -hmm. you know, you've been kind and they'll help you. So on the 17th of December, I, I, I went to bed having had a discussion with the people about getting my money. And then I went to bed at maybe nine and I woke up about seven o'clock. And when I went to check their number, or uh, they used to send me how the you know the like a, I guess like a uh, like a an account sheet it was all gone. It was the the number was gone. There was no accounts. There was no money, and so it was wiped out completely. You'd been completely cleaned out. Yeah, everything, everything. They didn't leave me with one penny. Nothing at all. They they'd been doing this over the period of two or three years and they got into a very skillful set by giving me fake contracts, fake signatures, fake cards. All the cards turned out to be fake. I took them to the police and the banks and they said, no, they're just fake. So 600 of them are fake. Um, and so I went to their house, they were gone and that was it. That was it. Within nine hours I went from being a wealthy guy with a good life and a nice house and a business and some investments to being nothing. And of course those investments depend on you keeping up the payments yeah. and, and things like that. Yeah, it? because I had the staff in, in Bali and I had to pay them and each of the staff had kids. So my responsibility is not just for the staff, it's for the children as well. They depended on me and also for the investments to make sure that they're taken care of plus the general condition of the investment you make in Bali, and also, of course, my life in the Philippines. And it's funny how things can just disappear. And I had no idea. And I know it sounds silly, but I, I just didn't... It was very clever, and I, I didn't see it coming. You went to the police? I did. I went to the police, and I went to the bank, and I came in with the bank with all 600 fake ATM cards, and, and really all they did was just call the rest of the staff and say, look at this foreigner, he was scammed. And, and they said, well, your cards are black. But this bank called the BPS, the, the Bank of the Philippines, they don't make black cards. They only make uh, blue and red. Mm -hmm. So they said it's obvious that, mm -hmm. it's, that it's fake. But they wouldn't say that in court because they said the problem is between you and the people, not between the bank and the, and the mm -hmm. people. So they wouldn't uh, guarantee or verify. So then I went to the court and I filed um, a very long, because you have to send six copies in the, in the Philippines, one to Manila, one mm -hmm. to Cebu, one to the court, one to the judge. And so we, a very long process. And uh, I sent that with all the fake cards, with the full uh, statements of what had happened, with witnesses, uh, with fake signatures already checked that it's fake by a handwriting expert. But they, they dismissed it. So no result at all? Nothing. Nothing at all. So within within a week, I think, maybe 10 days, I'd lost my place that I stayed in because I had done a deal, as you do with the landowners over there. I couldn't pay that. That was gone. Um, the money was gone. The people were gone. But they still showed off on Facebook and... You know, they showed off their new car, they showed off their new house and all these things that they were enjoying in life. But for me, I, I went, well, nowhere. I went down. I, I had nowhere to stay. So I slept outside for a while, anywhere I could, in other people's sofas and in, in borrowing somebody's room for a couple of weeks, just wherever I could, because it was the peak of uh, COVID at that time as well. Mm -hmm. And the law in COVID, uh, the law in, in the Philippines on COVID is very different, and they're very harsh 
and they round you up and you know they take you to a youth center you've got to do like 500 push-ups or you get fined um so i couldn't get back home obviously i had no money and so i couldn't leave and i couldn't stay you were on the streets basically i stayed on the streets um trying to figure out like how did, imagine you know how did this happen i mean there's a different kind of good in different continents. There's a UK good. There's a there's a there's a Far East good. There's a South American good. And some people see your good from the UK. You think you can automatically transfer that good into the into Asia. And I'm not saying all of Asia, but but you have to be careful because that good that you take over is seen as a as a weak good. Mm. So people think here's a kind-hearted guy, you know, who was willing to help all that. Let's you know let's do that. So suddenly I found myself. With nowhere to stay, no money, no food. What did you do for food? I begged. I asked people to help. I tried to borrow from other foreigners. Sometimes I would go to a cafe and when they f half finished the food, I would just slowly move the, the plate over. And so I did that for a while. Um, and as, as I said, I learned to be a good pool player. So I would play pool just for a few bucks and just get some food. So if you do it for one day, then you can do it the next day. So you live kind of day by day. There was no plan. It's just I survived that night and I stayed maybe in somebody else's yard or maybe in somebody else's like uh, full down bed or whatever it was. And then the next day was the next day. It was like repeating, you know, a brand new life every day, a kind of survival. The other day you told me that when you thought you were at rock bottom, you met someone with a dog. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because it was a really bad year because obviously I'd, I'd lost my, my relationship broke up, I lost all the money, and I know this sounds like a tragic country song, but I'd, I'd lost my money, my business, my home, I was in a country 8,777 miles from the UK, so I was far away in the middle of Covid, and it was almost New Year, like 20 minutes to New Year, and I thought, well, everything is gone. Nothing else could go wrong. I mean, what can what else can go wrong? My mum sadly passed in that year as well, and I went to visit my friend who has a pool a pool hall, but of course it was all black because of COVID. So I went to shake his hand, but I didn't know that he had two black kind of Labrador kind of large local dogs, big, big dogs, big dogs that protected the pool hall, and I stood on one of the dogs. He was lying down at his feet, so I shook his hand and, and then the dog attacked me and bit me in a place that men don't really like to be bit. Your <laughs> testicles. Yeah, they bit me in the testicles, yeah. yeah. So I rushed off to the toilet and I thought, oh, I hope it's just going to be just a flesh wound, but it wasn't. They bit in and taken a little bit. <laughs> so, I, so that was at 20 minutes to 12, you know, and uh, I thought, okay, kind of sums up the year. Um, you're uh, laughing now, Bob, but I don't oh, think you're laughing now. So. And the, the the owner of the pool hall, he gave me ten pounds or the equivalent of ten pounds to go buy the, you know, the stuff that the kind of anti antiseptic stuff. Mm -hmm. So I had to put that, which sent me into the moon. So uh, it's a year I don't want to remember, you know. No. How did you get back? I borrowed. Mm -hmm. I borrowed a thousand dollars on the guarantee that uh, seven hundred pounds because that was the ticket. So the cheapest ticket to get back was a layover in Qatar for eighteen hours. So I got through all the necessary screenings for COVID and stuff like that, and then I I got back. I flew back from uh, Manila to uh, Qatar, Qatar to London, London to here. So I borrowed that money, and I have to pay back double that money. That's just when you don't have anything, you'll do anything to get back. Um, and I wasn't feeling well. I, I, I'd been I'd been begging from people, and I'd been trying to survive and eating rubbish, and and I and I just started feeling kind of weird, just like my my neck was hurting, and you know I, I was struggling to swallow stuff like that. So I thought mm, something kind of not right here, you know. And I started to develop a a bump on my on the right side of my neck. Mm -hmm. So I figured, right, okay, I better get back. And the UK is a wonderful place. The NHS is incredible for that. So I managed to get back here. Um, to Inverness? Yeah, on, on my 60th birthday, on June the 8th. So I got back to Inverness. 
and then um, my good friend Titch McCooey, mm-hmm. as you will know, many people will, yeah. he, he helped me with a place to stay for a while and then I started, I registered with the doctors and I went there several times, four or five times. Um, and the bump got a bit bigger and then they gave me antibiotics and stuff like that and it didn't work. And um, I started to cough up blood and I went to the accident and emergency at Rigmar Hospital and they, they said, well, we need to check this because it's a bit abnormal. So they put the camera down my throat and then they said, OK, we think there's maybe something else. So they did two biopsies. First one they did was the, uh, the biopsy on my neck with the ultrasound and then the second one they did was the uh, general anaesthetic biopsy further down because the problem was at the base of my tongue yeah so then the following day they said um it's tongue cancer mm. so it's a big word doesn't it yeah cancer yeah it, it it it's something you don't, you don't want to hear and, and when you do hear it you know you realize that it, it, it is a real it's a real situation and a real problem everywhere but it's not something you ever think will happen. I just thought I had the sore throat because I was eating all the wrong stuff. Yeah. And um, they said, we need to get you to get radiotherapy and chemotherapy. And and indeed, the reason you're speaking to me today is because quite soon you might have some difficulty speaking for a while. Yeah, because next, next week I start on the 14th of... Um, November, I go into the hospital and I get the first radiotherapy. So I've had the mask, they, 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 they put a mask on you so it's written nice and tight so they can atta- attack the, the cancer. So I, I go there on the 14th and then I get chemotherapy on the 16th. And of course, it's going to affect your tongue because you, you, know, you, you can't speak so well, you can't swallow, mm-hmm. uh, stuff like that. So I, I'm, I'm excited to do it because... It's the next step. Instead of it being a, a really tragic thing, it's like, okay, this is the, the worst thing. Now let's let's make it better, you know? Yeah. So it's kind of, this is the last point. Now let's move forward. So you move forward with the treatment. Um, I'm sure recovery will, will come. Uh, um, yeah. Uh, as someone who's been through something similar myself, uh, I was saying to my wife the other day that it's odd how we reach this point of 59, 16, so many of our friends or people we knew have had a cancer diagnosis. Yeah. But on the bright side, we know so many people who survived a cancer diagnosis yeah. as, as, as well. And so we wish you all the best with that, obviously. But beyond that, Bobby, plans? Yes. Because you have to have that. So when on the day they gave me the diagnosis, I wrote a 10-step plan. And, and it's not a wish list or a guess or a hope. It's something that I will absolutely do. And the first step was get back to full health. So there's nothing I can do about that. So thankfully from NHS and their school, I don't have to worry about that side. Yeah. So what I'm going to try to do is to kind of um, repair myself inside. So I'll do all the work inside. I'll, f- I'll, I'll fix myself on the inside. Um, and thankfully allow the, the experts and the, and the consultants and specialists to, to do what they do best here. So I already see myself as being uh, cured. Yeah. I already do that. And now I'm working back as to how did I get it. Yeah. So that's what I'm doing now. And every day I wake up and I say, you're fine. And, and, and I'm thankful for my health. And I'm thankful for being where I am. And I'll get myself back to health. And then the next thing will be to reestablish some kind of purpose. Because once you lose your purpose, I never realized this, but... My purpose before was always the radio, the properties. I had a I had a reason for getting up every morning. And when that's gone, a man should look into that because once your reason's taken away, there's not much else. You, you haven't got a reason. So now I'm going to give myself a reason, whether, or not, whether it's to do another business, whether it's to go work in Tesco's, but I'll have a reason to get up every morning. Yeah. And, and that's the plan to, to do that. Well, I'll, I'll give the advice I gave myself when I was diagnosed with cancer, which was, hey, maybe there's a book in this. So <laughs> yeah, 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 it would be a good idea to do a book. I mean, especially, I never realised, you know, from all my life has been wonderful, and this has just been a couple of bad years, but I never realised the kindness that's in the world from people. And I think I'd like to, to do a book and to spend a great deal of that time looking at the positives 
from, from, from what's happened in my, in my life. And I've learned so much from the last three years, probably more than I've learned in the, in the previous 57. Um, so looking forward to doing something exciting in the future. So I'm really excited for the treatment. And when they, when they phone me to tell me I've got to go in and get it done, yeah. I'm like really grateful. So I, I'm looking forward to the next part um, because I've still got... I'm 60, so I've still got a long way. And, and there's so much can be done in a day these days. So I can do a lot in a few years, I think. Well, we're always looking for volunteers here. Absolutely. So. <laughs> Ab well, it'd be great to do something like that. Yeah. Well, Bob, um, I must stop calling you Bobby because you've outgrown it. But, <laughs> uh, but uh, Bob, we wish you all the very best with your treatment and your recovery. And I very much look forward to seeing you on the author circuit. Well, thank and on you. on the public speaking circuit and warning other people about the... I don't know if the perils of being over generous, but uh, being wary in life, I suppose, is the way to look at it. Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point because it's one thing that I've really learnt is that it's okay to be to be kind and it's okay to have this desire, but some people don't share that. There's always some somebody else looking at you know the attraction, as it were. But be kind, stick to who you are. Just be a little bit more you know careful. I, I wasn't careful because I thought, well, it's family and you know my girlfriend's family so I figured that everything would be fine but I'd like to in a gentle way to say to some people you know like enjoy because Asia is a wonderful place and all these countries are great Philippines is great Vietnam Bali they're all great but just there's a few things you might a kind of red flag and I, I have had that experience now so I'd like to be able to say enjoy your time there but just here's a thing to to avoid and, and I think that's the way I'd like to go Bob McLennan, thank you very much for being a guest on Mr. LB. Thank you, thank you, Jim. Ways to Wellbeing is produced in Inverness, Scotland by Partnerships for Wellbeing, a registered charity. To find out more about our services, go to p4w.org.uk.